Because we're well saved. That's saved a fifth precinct for when you do him. So what do you want to do? Um, August record that. Uh, oh, I was I was thinking okay. how that Nazi shit. Oh, all cause the way. because your the dad kid. was in prison with them. That's that the whole connection. French connection. Mm -hmm. And that that China white bag mm -hmm. that everybody who got a coat of that bag that your man. Don't know all the people who made all that stupid money. Oh, they invented they invented the game. So <clears throat> Courtney was interested. I just put up a um, piece about August okay. recording the French Connection. But the first <clears throat> people in the early '60s. Wait a minute. Wait, up, the intro. Up to no, Al Prophet American Dope. Oh yeah. boy, my voice. They love you still, Al. <clears throat> Al Prophet American Dope. Yeah. Boy, I'm gonna have to whisper on this one. Oh, I hear the mic, you. The mic I hear is good. Okay. So, um, who are the real architects of? the major drug business. Well, of course, the faces we see in the movies and the TV are of the African-American persuasion. Oh, I'm sorry. We live people. Go ahead, keep Not talking. Oh, and I didn't drive. No, it's uh, CT. You can let him in. If he's a big yellow light-skinned guy, you can let him in. <laughs> um, but, but a lot of Nazis involved in the early global drug trade. So down in Bolivia, <coughs> you had uh, Thank you, KK. Thanks, brother. Got, got a celebrity. Got some, got some got real a, security. Got celebrity security. Celebrity security. Celebrity, celebrity, security. celebrity, celebrity. <laughs> KK. Yeah, celebrity if bounce. the bricks could talk, yeah, that is the correct name of the, the book, right? If yeah, the bricks these, could talk. These bricks could talk. If these bricks can talk, great book, historic book coming out. Oh my God, a big homie, KK. But back to it. So, August Record, architect of kind of how this whole golden era of H. So, so he was um, a part of. So when the Nazis took over Germany, I mean France, <clears throat> some of the French government collaborated, and they let them set up their own government in a little spa town called Vichy. And <clears throat> of course, they had responsibilities to get Jews to steal money, and so there was a French Gestapo called the Carlinga. There was a famous French soccer player involved. There was French police, and there was just general lowlifes like August Record. So once uh, the war ended and uh, the day of reckoning was coming, they were hanging people like, "Oh, you helped the Nazis!" Boop, you're going on the gallows, guillotine, all that. August Record. He wasn't nobody. The U.S. government didn't help him like they helped some scientists, but he made it to South America. So he started in Argentina as a pimp, peddling flesh. And then as it gets into the late 50s and <clears throat> early 60s, it goes to Paraguay, which had, that was the haven for Nazis. Paraguay is a little landlocked country in the middle of South America that has nothing, that has a bizarre history. It actually had a law where if you were a white European, you couldn't have a child with a white European. You can only have children with indigenous. And if you're indigenous, you can have a child with indigenous. You can only have a child with white European because they wanted to create an actual Paraguayan race <laughs> to destroy uh, the caste system, which they did. But sitting above that, you had General Strassner, of course, German name, and he was very Nazi friendly. And that became, Paraguay was the haven for the Nazis. And that's where Record moved to and set up <clears throat> this global chessboard of the French Corsican gangsters, Turkish heroin, Southeast Asian heroin, because remember, <clears throat> uh, French colonies in the Middle East and Southeast Asia were heroin source countries. And of course, Turkey's right there to Lebanon and to Egypt. So this is the bag that came to be known as the French Connection. That's right. He was. August Record put the connection in the French. So. Mm -hmm. He was sitting down in South America, and in the early, late 50s and early 60s, the French Mafia <clears throat> was smuggling. It's funny, you think about a person getting off a plane from Bogota now as big, like, hey, do you have drugs? 
But back then it was you getting off a plane from Paris. Because the labs were all in France. They were outside of Marseille. <clears throat> so they would bring the raw opium from Turkey and turn it into heroin in France. Of all, I mean, it's just funny how the world changes. Right. And they would smuggle it over. And the uh, French were so trusting with each other because they're from, well, they're not really French. They're Corsican from a little island. So like a Sicily, but it's even smaller than Sicily and more tight-knit. So to this day, there's never been an infiltration of the Union Corps, the French Mafia. And uh, they would come over and they would serve the Italian Mafia. And you said also, though, that they had some Cuban Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Now, is this... Is this that, is all through the intelligence. Figure? So, because... Okay, so, why were these Nazis all allowed to be in South America? There were scientists... <clears throat> smuggled to the U.S. who were war criminals who did help set up NASA. Okay, is that okay or not? I mean, that's one question. Maybe. But the ones that were allowed to be in South America, they were just allowed to be there for security because they had experience oppressing people. So, <clears throat> as U.S. corporations wanted to maintain low wages, this is what I figured out because it's kind of hard to, like, why did all this go on? You have these low-wage countries <clears throat> south of the border. You need right-wing governments to oppress indigenous movements, union movements. They're going to call it communism to make it sound like it's something to do with the Soviets. But a lot of times it was just, hey, we want higher wages. But now you've got these Nazis training the security forces how to not just be security, how to tear. It's one thing to control. It's another to terrorize. You need to learn skills, right? Oh no, you want to terror go go R A P E the mother in front of the little boys. They don't even grow up to even buck at all. It's sort of like uh think about how the, in the terror on the black slave African population to where you have to terrorize people so much as children they don't even grow up to think about challenges doing system. nothing. So that's why these Nazis were allowed to thrive in South America. And August Record and Klaus Barbie <clears throat> down in Bolivia, who helped Roberto Suarez, Sosa, the, Scarface. The so you did a, oh, what, yeah. what you call that, the real Sosa? Yeah. But there were a lot of them. This is the there same bag that you think, because you, when you're Frank Matthews' work, Frank had a South American connection, right? Well, he did a deal. I mean, they had information. That there was a deal in 19, maybe 71, when Frank was estimated that a third, I mean, these statistics, I where do they get them from? But even if it's semi-true, that a third of all the heroin entering into the U.S. passed through Frank Matthews' hands in 1971. So they had to be connected with this guy. With Four, crew, right? 400 kilos of heroin floated in old Nazi uh there were mines where, like, you took a big hollow metal ball and put explosives in it and floated off the coast of France. When the Allied invasion came, it would hit ships. They had empty ones of those left over, filled them with heroin, floated it to New York. This is under record because who has the connections for the heroin there? Who knows about Nazi mines? Who even knows that shit is there? Who knows how to use them? Nazis. Like, who's going to know? that there's these empty mines in the ocean and how to get them and how to fill them and how to move them <clears throat> so that when they get off New York coast, scuba divers can go get it and bring it to Brooklyn. And you were saying, or your guy Levine, the... the he a worked a case, the picture frame case, right. where they were getting high-end people. So they were getting like French television stars. French, oh, this, they had a chess, uh, an international chess prodigy that was... When he would travel, he was like, oh, I'm, I'm into art. And he would he would buy expensive art, but he would fill the picture frames. So that was the first people doing cocaine and heroin together. I was going to say, the first guy, he was one of the first people. People know there was a lot of cocaine coming into the country, even by the late 60s. But it was, New York pretty much was getting it. But, you know, uh, if you even read stuff, by the early 70s, New York had a lot of cocaine. Well, so this it just is, didn't filter well, out to the rest of the country. That uh, <clears throat> me and Lou was speaking about. So let me get another uh, cough drop. Keep talking. Go ahead. Um, cocaine in its 
attitude in the 70s and all of that. So, well, I, I, your your opinion on whether this tie-in. So I'm pretty sure that the, the dope that Eddie was getting from Carmine Lombardoza, a.k.a. Doc Gambino. Or it's coming from the French. Was coming from the French Connection, which would have been the your... And was orchestrating it. That so, would have been the same band. So to go back to Paraguay, Record sitting down in Paraguay and he's protected. So when he was indicted, I think like the son of like the fucking head of the military or something in Paraguay was indicted and he gets taken into custody. And he's in MCC Manhattan, uh, Metropolitan Correction. You know, the federal holding, you know what those are. Like, right, yeah, that's the big boy yeah. stuff. Yeah. That's what you face in a big federal case. He's sitting in the Manhattan federal detention he escaped. Who you ever heard escape from a fucking federal detention center? The son of the head of the Paraguayan military disappears and pops back up in Paraguay. And did like no time. Well, he did a couple weeks while he was in there, but yeah, he didn't know. He never got, never went to trial. Wow. And so record ends up Andre. So I had to, I had to order. To learn a lot of this, I had to um, do a lot of research, and I tracked down a long article. Uh, wasn't on the internet, but I knew it existed in a, like a 1972 Reader's Digest. So I had to go on eBay and find, and it was called, like a man called Andre, and it was about record. So someone had written about it then, and so I had to get the physical thing and read it. It was pretty, you know, when you're doing kind of. I don't say original research because somebody, a journalist, did the original research, but to find, have to find the documents as opposed to just, oh, this is what it says on Wikipedia. Right. Because a lot of things don't appear. That thing about the Paraguayan <clears throat> general's son, that's nowhere on the Internet, but it happened. Because once you read it, then you know you can go <clears throat> to the New York Times of you know, February 10th, 1974, and look, 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 and you see a little thing, uh, 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 per, uh, you know, a Paraguayan military official. Because Paraguay at son. first didn't want to, even when the feds and the no, America they wanted them, they didn't even want to let them no, get they had, they, they, had to, they had to capture them in other countries or something. And then they had to put, like, a lot of pressure on them, like, we'll blockade your fucking country. If you don't turn it in. And he still, what, they, they gave him 20. He only you, did 10 years. So for the biggest heroin dealer in history. Not just dealer, the responsible for, <clears throat> you know, drugs were always around, obviously. But, like, as you know, like your father, everybody talks about prior to the mid-60s, you know, even marijuana. Like, it was for, you were a musician, you were a prostitute, you were a gang. Like, you had to really seek, like, hey, I want to use drugs. Who do I go go over there and tell them, you know, so-and-so. But then by the late 60s, we were talking about how the projects got bad, suddenly drugs are on the street corner. They're in the schools. These are the people that orchestrated that. So when you guys and in the comment section these are Nazis. These keep are, blaming these are, us for destroying these the These are Nazis. <laughs> we didn't, we were, we was pawns in this game. Less than pawns. <laughs> Less than pawns. El Chapo's a pawn. See what I'm saying? So that may big meat or something is not even on the chessboard on a global scale. Right, when they, I know you like, get the same comments I get. You know. And then just one comment had just come in where the, we had, he was responding to something about Maserati Rick. Right. He's like, well, I hope y'all got boots on the ground to rebuild the neighborhoods that you destroyed. And I'm like, man, y'all give us too much credit. It would have been a We didn't have that kind of influence to yeah. destroy mm -hmm. nothing. Mm -hmm. We was playing a game that was already set up and the rules were arranged. Man, you were hanging out on the sidelines getting called into substitution for two minutes <laughs> for an ongoing soccer game. You know Good what analogy. I mean? I mean, for real. Yeah. And just because somebody scored a goal or did something cool, yeah, it wasn't, wasn't the game pre existed and continues to exist. And the referee is the U.S. government. So they the it, referee it, is the U.S. government, and they they, choose they say basically win. he yeah. got he only did the ten because of his loyalty for not snitching out the CIA. That I, you know, for that guy, because mind you, he was in USP Atlanta 
where your father's buddy, well not buddy, but somebody he talked to, was murdered. Vince Papa. Who was stealing dope, was the fr that very French connection, <clears throat> dope that got seized and went into the New York police evidence locker. When they went to go to trial on it, it was flopped. All right, so just to give you guys a uh, backdrop of what he's talking about, when Pops, the, 70, the 32 man indictment where him and Eddie, the other 32 go down, Eddie go to Leavenworth, they send Pops down to Atlanta. When he catch up in Atlanta, half the people that's down there is friends of Carmine La Madozzi, the Italians, Gambino crew. There was like nine people killed in USP Atlanta in like four months. Some were other things, but about four of them were connected to the French Connection. And I think Vince Papa was like getting the, the mix for them. No, oh, no, no, no. Oh. Vince Papa was a New York police detective who stole... When they made the, some of the early, <clears throat> the record case was actually 50k, like it was a sort of like a, think of it like it was a, a global BMF, where there's a bunch of people are the French Connection and there's all kind of deals going on. Meech and T are like the glue of everything, but it's stuff going on all around the country. Well, think about record and a few other people as like the glue, they called it, they had the triangle of death, <clears throat> where they had the prosecutor put up green pins for money transfers, red for drug transfers, because they never did the money dope, and black pins for murder. And when you did all the murders from Europe to the U.S. down into Brazil, the triangle of death. And so... Down into Paraguay, it was, yeah. Vince Papa knew, Pop knew some of the same Italians. And I don't know if it was the which one of the families it was. Gambino. He was a Gambino. Gambino. So, so he definitely knew that click. Mm -hmm. so That's he, who Doc Lombardo was. Right. He cuts in the pop and basically he knows that they think he's snitching. Like Vince Papa knew. He was a cop too. Yeah. That, well, he wasn't no, but here's the thing with Papa. He wasn't, he was a New York police detective who stole the shit and resold it. <laughs> Now, mind you, that was huge amounts. So he resold it to the very people that was seized from. Now, probably, if you went deep into the archives, you might find Vince Papa is the one that provided information or helped arrest some of the cases. They thought he was telling. So he, oh, I mean, he was a cop. He was. <laughs> so I'm saying, like, I get you locked up, and then I steal the dope from your case and resell it to your crew. Oh, Sound like somebody you might want to kill. Yeah. So, but do we cut an old man and say, "Can you talk to your friends in New York?" Tell no. him, man, I'm not. And Papa's like, "Man, I can't I get involved in that guinea thing, man. You all right? He you was my man." Smart for that. Yeah, he was like, "But uh, I can't get that." So, cause they that's y'all Italian <laughs> shit. I'm on the black folks side. Cause and, they they and, killed a boss. They killed the boss of the um. They killed Tommy Eboli, who was the boss of the Lucchese family. Cause in about was he down in Atlanta too? Because they was killing no, down they in Atlanta. No, they killed him on the street. Oh, they come on the street. In '59, Vito Genovese got rigged. <laughs> Carlo Gambino helped the police put a snitch into Vito Genovese's. These guys are real snakes, like the real organized. Carmine Persico was there, called the snake. He was doing time with the old man too. Actually, Carlo Gambino orchestrated Nelson Cantaloupe's uh, Puerto Rican to infiltrate Vito Genovese and got Vito Genovese a heroin case. So that's why Vito Genovese was in USP Atlanta when Joe Valachi came. Joe Valachi, I forget what happened. He, he mistakenly thought someone was going to try to kill him. So he went and assaulted Vito Genovese's right-hand man or something. And then he knew he was marked for death, and that's when he told if Vito Genovese had not have been in federal prison for that heroin case, Joe Valachi would have never testified. And for the parties, Joe Valachi's credit as being really the first mob guy to, to really break Omo Omota. Omerta and really go into detail. Because he, he, he gave him the whole chart, right? Oh, it was a book, yeah. And a movie. Yeah, yeah. And a movie. But it was a, it was a, Charles Bronson. Yeah, but it was a nonfiction book that really was important that like because he charted it out right these are the guys the, the, the FBI didn't acknowledge it circa 1960 there officially was no mafia there was Italian criminals in different cities but they didn't know there's no commission and they don't meet that's crazy that's not real so but back to Joe Velocity 
Yeah. And he wouldn't have been doing that unless he was afraid of his life for assaulting either Vito Genovese or his buddy, or I forget what the story was. So the mafia said, we're out of heroin. So that's when they came up with, we're going to give it to the blacks and the Puerto Ricans. But now as it gets into like 1972, they're like, shit, there's too much money being made. We want back in. So they gave Tommy Eboli $4 million to cop and something, and I got all fucked up. And I think Vincent Papa was part of that seizure. They got fucked up. Something, yeah, it was all, I, I, you know, it's kind of complicated. But yeah, he was a New York police detective. There was the four million got seized. And who was that real tough guy that served Frank Mathis at the end? Uh, Lou Cirillo. Uh, okay. Yeah. And then you have the last of the dangerous Jews. Uh, uh, Sperling. Who just died in prison a couple years yeah, ago. Yeah, he was down there. He was down there. Nicky Bonds is a girl. Like he's worse than no, he's, he's like, hey, no, he's, that's he a was, disrespect to those guys. He, he's worse than that. Yeah, he <laughs> was in from 73 to 20. Nicky got his son pop. 13. I mean, he did 45 years. But speaking of Nicky, Nicky also was getting that French, that same bag again. But he wasn't getting bag. it from the French. He was getting it from the Italians. Who was get, yeah, he was getting it from uh, M.M. Uh, the her or Maddie Madonna. Maddie Madonna. Is that the guy he was locked up with? No, that's who he got the case with. Yeah. So Maddie Madonna wasn't even a. This is how disconnected the mob wanted to be from the heroin trade. They wouldn't even serve the blacks themselves. It was they had the Jew, who weren't yet made. Like Maddie Madonna wasn't made. Associate. That's right. But he did that 20 years. And he got out, and they jumped him straight to Capo. He didn't have to be a soldier. He's still out. Is he still alive? He got another case. Like they made him the boss. He got a. I think he's got another murder. Case. I forget what happened with him, but he had a new case. But he was alive. He just got like a life case in maybe 2018 or something. But it's crazy that that shit all started back in World War II, spilled all the way over into the 60s, 70s. It's listen. And affected warfare. Could that World War II where you had the map from about. 1936 to 1945, you had this violent, oppressive, beyond just a military state, like a sick, you know, we're rounding people up and just murdering them just because, which is kind of a new thing in history, you know, like that direct. Like, we're not even using you as slave, just come die. It created all these monsters who then... When, the, when it was and the war was ending and they were saying, okay, the world is going to be communist versus capitalist. Well, who's the best? Who, what expendable pawns can we, the U.S. government, these Nazi killers, they've been killing and robbing and pillaging for nine years. These people is valuable. Let them go to South America and we'll activate them as needed. But them guys had their own agenda too. So, you know, there you got two projects that I think kind of go into that. <clears throat> Cold War, heroin heat. Cold War, heroin heat. And also the black power, Just white. Mm -hmm. okay. White powder, black power, right? So those kind of dovetail. Like the white powder, black power is the street side of what? If so, who's the most marginalized economic group in the country who is also in the big cities? Well, as, as you get into the late 60s, early 70s, just as a lot of blacks are finally, enough blacks are in the big cities to like, oh, we're getting a little political and economic power. Well, the industrial economy has started to change and go down. So if you were black, if you didn't make it into that, if your family didn't make it into that going to college thing by the early 70s, you were kind of left out in the cold. You're still in the projects, you, you know, and 
the industrial jobs are by the year is less and less. Why did YBI arise? Well, it was less and less auto jobs. Well, that's what that was about. Your I mean, your, 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 your father and them or had it organized like you work an eight-hour shift, you get overtime. They modeled the business after double the Double pay on Christmas, yes. all that. Five-day, 40-hour work week, double time if you work the spot. Because they could do it. Yeah. So you're no, that's what they knew. And they didn't know how to plant work. the so. plant was a hard... Listen, yeah. for all of you that think... One of the more, my, more, more interesting fields of study, if it's got nothing to do with crime, so I haven't talked about that much, but it's very... Is studying what was plant life. Uh, the amount of death. The plants were more dangerous than the streets. The Eddie, plants were more dangerous than Eddie the streets. And he loses his thumb at the plant and got paid. Which is he said, what, I'd rather sell dope. And which is what got him the thirty five, the thirty eight hundred dollar settlement check that he bought his first bag. That, with. That, yeah. that, there was a plant yeah. that El Eldrum. El, there was a plant on the east side, the El Eldrum axle or something. It was so bad. There's a case. Oh, maybe I, that'll be my Black History Month story. There was a black auto worker who goes into this plant on the east side. Oh yeah, Happy Black History Month. Murders three <laughs> white co-workers. Goes on trial. The white, mostly white jury finds him not guilty by reason of insanity because the the um, conditions in the plant were so bad. Inch of oil on the floor. So you're working, standing in oil. Uh there was, they forced the Chrysler lawyers to admit there were times when a person's part of their finger got chopped off in the morning. You back at work at noon. You don't even go home. Uh, some uh, black female, like, she was like a jan considered a janitor. She like, got like a thrombosis, you know, like your veins swell up in her leg. They were like, nah, you gotta come to work, just be in a wheelchair. She dies like at work, you know. Like people, the plant was more, some of those plants, a lot of where they had the black workers, Dodge Main, the elder plant, the older plants, the certain type of parts of the process, the foundries, where a lot of the black workers were at, but also poor white workers, but mostly black. It was more dangerous. Between getting maimed and dying, it was more dangerous to stand and sell and dope in the booster projects. Like, I've calculated the statistics. Wow, wow. And and nowadays, you think, oh, those unions ruined everything, and they had it so easy. My father quit, too. He said he got a job at Cray. He's like, I'm not doing this shit. Pops, before he, that's when he went to driving the bus. He tried to plant, because the I plant was good. It. He lasted about three days at I the plant. I can't do it. He said, I take the bus over this. At least I get to be outside, talk to people, because he's like, that plant life. Boy. That's why the heroin was so big, probably, because a lot, like, friends of mine I have whose family members worked in the plant. I, as I got older, I realized, like, oh, your blah, blah has probably been to their whole life because that's how they work at the plant. Because that shit is so mind-numbing and hard. It's not as bad now, but even now it's not easy. But back 1979, you black woman at GM, like, oh, man, they got you doing some As bullshit. late as the 90s. Lift man. this up. As Do this 7,000 times a day for 30 years. As late as the 90s, you knew that the best time to get your bag out there was before that first shift. About five, five, about five o'clock. And it depended on what plant you was <laughs> at, too. Yeah. Depending on what plant. Some of the plant, like Dodge Main, was, well, we was notorious. We, we, we was over there by, oh, no, I'm about by Jefferson, yeah, yeah, Jefferson yeah. plant yeah, yeah, on yeah. Um, the new one. St. Jean. Yeah, yeah. So we was on French Road, so you had to know at 5 o'clock you was going to get that rush. Like, dude, Everybody you, go to you got uh, something I wanted to work in. We, uh, uh, that script we have about the Detroit economy and drug trade, the city adult thing. You got to do that, out. One of the plot lines that I have in there is about the drum, Dodge Revolutionary Union Movement which was a combination of like a black militant with union. Because you had certain plants that were like 95% black workers and those had the most industrial accidents, the, the most deaths, the most maimings. They were more violent than the streets. We need to do that. So we can talk about all of this tied in. The international shit, the, <clears throat> the, the, the street stuff. It, the, the people don't, it's all connected. Society because it, People as people. You don't say. People as people, <laughs> right? People at the plant got a real life and they having to make You mean decisions. this only exists because some Asian child is doing this all day nah, for this, 75 cents? This 
this phone that was fifteen hundred dollars by right should be fifteen thousand. Yeah. But the cobalt that's in it. Oh, not to mention Congo, Africa. Oh, so they yeah. got some little yeah. girl in Africa. Yeah. So that y'all can go to the i store. Got no fingers. Ain't got no fingers, so y'all can only pay like for real fifteen hundred dollars for your phone because they only paying her a penny a day, a dollar a day. Well, we supposed to get worked up about Kanye West. No, they gonna tell me that we destroyed the neighborhood. <laughs> not Apple. Not Apple, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> not Apple, not Google, no, no, no. Y'all made two dollars, and it's y'all fault the shit fault. No, you, you know, human crazy. being, the more you know, like, it's, human beings are pretty disturbed and disturbing, like, all across the board. So, you guys, if I'm, check that out. Uh, Cold War heroin heat. White powder, black power. White power, black power. No, don't um, say white powder. No. White powder, <laughs> black powder. White powder, no. black power. Because you got some it. stuff that we yeah. did from back in the day to talk about speaking of black history. Um, Milton Henry, the lawyer, of course. Fascinating. Re Republic of New Africa. The, the intersection of uh, uh, the black Albert Craig, drug kingpins with the black militant movement, which, of course, ended very badly. I mean, by 1974, you have the mad dog killer, uh, what's his name? Edward uh, Brown. Who himself was... Killed near the Booster Projects in 1985 yeah. for a $10 bag of dope. Yeah. Forgotten. Right. And so it all, it, it, if you watch all of that stuff, and of course, I obviously watch Motown Mafia. Um, Go to their channel. Lou, producer. They have, they have 100, how many, what do you guys have, 100 clips up? We got 300 clips up. Mm, we got about, uh, getting close to 400. So that's Big Lou. So Lou what's, what's that, what Big, up, what Big up? Boss Filmworks? Yeah, Big, Big Boss, Boss Filmworks. Big Boss Filmworks, Filmworks. yeah, at yeah. YouTube, of course, and then you can hear the audio on Spotify. Mm -hmm. um, we got all kind of hot stuff coming. Patreon channel about to be released. Yes, yes, Patreon channel uh, February 6th. February 6th, release date These for Patreon These fancy jackets channel. don't buy themselves, I need some. Is right this on. one of your American Dope jackets? Might be. <laughs> <laughs> obviously, unless you follow the stuff you've been under the rock, obviously you know what Al's doing amazing things over at American Dope. Um, we trying to network some stuff with this American Dope apparel, yeah, make, it, we have, make yeah. it accessible to the people right here in the D. Mm -hmm. Oh well, all across the world. All across the world. You go use your uh, logistics and distribution skills for me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for good. I'm, I'm, I'm not even gonna say I'm number one. I'm prop apparel wise. I'm top four hundred. Brothers are making some money. That's, that's There's a Yiddish word called swatsa. It means the rag. <laughs> I've sold a lot of swatsa in my life. We're going to sell some more. We're going to sell some more. Yeah, yeah, we're making it happen. And we got a special guest that's sitting in on us, a brother by the name of KK. All right. Uh, famous, of course, you guys may have seen him before all this kind of stuff. Uh, he was Beautiful featured, mind. On, featured, on, um, featured on Blowing Money Fast, the uh, BMF documentary episode two. Um, of course, him and his brother, uh, Lawrence. Well, let's feature on the he's featured on the fictionalized. No, no, he's, they did him on the doc. Oh, they had him with Scott. He on both. Oh, he's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, episode two. They got a character. Right, that's what I thought. And then, oh, I didn't and know. And in the fictionalized, oh, okay. so in the blowing money fast doc, he's actually interviewed, so you get it right from his mouth. And then on the fictionalized, oh, I'll have to go watch it. Yeah, on the fictionalized um, in season two, there's a character by the name of K9, which is no? based. K9, it's a hybrid. I think it's a hybrid. Oh, it's over you and it's your like, I think they're like. K9 is my brother. It's your brother. You don't think they kind of merged both the characters? KK, dog. Because when I, I K -K get the KK, dog the is K9. K9 is dog. Mm -hmm. But it seemed like. Well, you guys going to have to read his book and then make some arrangements. Mike, don't be surprised if he's on American don't Dope. Don't be surprised. <laughs> and and um, uh, But it's going to be something for sale he when he, see. yeah. He, he like me. He, he's saving it till he got his. He got, yeah, he got to save because, I mean, this guy's got, he's got a phenomenal story. See, yeah. everybody in this town <clears throat> knows his name, name him, him and his brother's name been ringing for the last, and his father, legend down the project. So, people around this which town have known. Which projects is that? The Brewsters, not the, not the Jeffries. The Brewsters. But, you know, they was family. Brewsters and Jeffries. But there was a little, it wasn't, it was different families in each one. It was kind of a. Well, I went to school over there. You know, oh, Murray Wright is a Jeffrey project. Yeah, I was gonna say I want. Yeah, but what was the Brewster School? Eastern or something? Northeast. Oh, but they closed that in the early eighties. Oh, so all them. Okay, so both projects. was Because when I say the projects, I really be just talking uh, about Brewsters and Jeffries. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. just see them. But like, it is kind of two. It is two different. Yeah. Which one was Brewsters was slightly bigger, but Jeffries was big. Jeffries was big. Yeah, two sides. Yeah, two sides. Oh, Jeffries. The low rises and the high rises. Well, so did Brewsters. So the, that's true. 
Those are two of the bigger public housing projects in the country. The only things bigger was some a few in New York and the, like Robert Taylor. But like Chicago, nothing in LA, Green, nothing in LA. The biggest in LA was the same exact layout and size as Herman Gardens, which was which was big, but wasn't as big as Brewsters and Jeffries. Yeah, no, yeah. Mm. But there's a lot of a lot of um, synergy, a lot of synergy between Jack Brewsters and Brewsters and Jeffries for sure, for sure. Our family we was in the Jeffries. Well, Mama's side of family's in the Jeffries. Papa and all them from Black Bottom, they all was Brewster, basically the Brewsters. Because when they say the Brewsters, even they wasn't really in the projects. If you lived on the street next to the project, you just say yeah. you lived in the projects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Just like the Yeah. Same. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's all, all good. So a lot, of, lot, of, lot of history, man. Thank you for sitting in on this, Brother KK. I appreciate you guys. We'll man. talk yeah. to you soon. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, Motown Mafia Podcast, in conjunction with our profit, American Dope. We've been at it for a minute, man. This thing is going, going. We got to get these projects done now. I know you're busy getting a lot of money nowadays. No, I don't mean, it's just that like, people don't want to work these days. Man. Nobody wants to work. <laughs> Maybe now that they stop giving out that goddamn free money and free yeah, rent. Yeah, some motivation might come back. Some motivation. Yeah, some thug motivation. <laughs> <laughs> no, dude, you ain't got to pay rent, and we're going to get you some money. And you're going to pay the utilities, no rent. And we ain't going to arrest nobody. And then eggs cost $20. Well, no, because All right. you got to pay the bill. You got to pay the bill. How much, oh. is a, how much is a carton of eggs? About $10 now. And what we doing? Yeah, oh, no, man. man it's, it's crazy, Al. It's crazy. I mean, I don't really. When I go to the grocery store, I just cash out. But, I mean, <laughs> hey, no, 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 everybody no. bless. But you got, don't forget the struggle, man. The struggle's still real out there, man. The struggle's still real. I'm trying to forget it. Your man. Your it's man that popped time. in and did the mm -hmm. intro. GQ. We, GQ. We're going to do, do some more stuff coming up. Yeah, it's so collaborating, bringing some more people under. So we got some police corruption. Police. Good police. Good. The the both sides. He gonna of the talk story. about police corruption. He gonna talk. We ain't got no police corruption. No 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 no. I mean I'm gonna tell you, I, it was never personal with me with the police. I mean they. I'm saying we're not currently engaged in any police corruption. No no no, no we ain't doing no police corruption. We're all. Yeah, we're just, yeah, just content creators. Well, I'm saying he said. <laughs> so it's all good, bro. You good? Anything yes. else want to do? Well, other appreciate you. Pardon, pardon my voice. I was I was screaming at Courtney last night <laughs> over the loud music. I was going to say. At the Cabaret Hall. The Cabaret Hall. <laughs> on Michigan Avenue. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, all jokes aside, my damn father is so. You know that phrase, did you grow up in a barn? Well, I did. Because there wasn't no woman in the house. It was just me and my father. To this day, as soon as I, every time I come visit, my voice hurts because he yelled like we yelled, not like fighting. He just is like a loud, like, hey, I, and then I got to yell to hear over him. Y'all loud people. We are. That's what we get away. <laughs> we are loud <laughs> people. Yeah, I had to use my liquor store voice on my father. My vocal cords got weak since I've been in say, LA. It wasn't like that last night. No, nah, well, that was, I had to talk to my father on the phone. Uh, I done got soft in LA. I got to get my liquor, liquor store vocal cords back. <laughs> <laughs> All right, family. Appreciate you guys. Make sure you guys are hitting that like, share, and subscribe button. Again, thanks again, Brother KK, for sitting in. You're going to hear a lot more from great stuff. Detroit legend in the house. Al Prophet, American Dope, you're doing it. We ain't got to speak no more about it. Big That's Lou. A Fendi Fact. Fendi Fact. Big Lou, you good? I'm good, baby. All right, it's your man, CRB Jr., Big Boss Filmworks, Motown Mafia Podcast. Holla at your man. Peace. All right, peace.